The question of non-fission ignition. Non-fission ignition would mean no A-bomb, just a fusion bomb, non-fission. So Joseph P. Farrell was just telling us, if you can figure out a neutronic fusion, you can create a fusion bomb without the fission bomb. So now this opens the door to a clean, pure fusion bomb. So if that's what they solved, then this text might have some answers for us. The next page, thermonuclear microexplosions, the next chapter, and I'm going to go through some highlights of these in a second, talks about how to create a tiny fusion bomb reaction that could be used for propulsion, could be used for propulsion. The designs are very crude, but right off my bat, I was thinking in my head, wait, could you make a plasmoid with that and then use the plasmoid as propulsion? I think there are direct connections to this micro explosion concept and to the idea of plasmoid. There's lithium, de deuterized lith lithium six right there. You can see it's being used as the fission, as the fusion material right there. So a lot of this, when you look at these designs, it's all about symmetry and, and uh, geometry. It's all about creating these like cylindrical or tear shaped designs. And they're trying to figure out how do we make the shock wave? How do we make the shock wave hit the fusion material? How do we ignite the fusion material? That's what they're all trying to figure out. Every single one of them. Friedwart Winterberg was one of the first people to investigate and use a high velocity projectile as the, fis the fission ignition. What? Yes. So you have your fusion bomb here and you're going to shoot it with a projectile. As long as the projectile is moving fast enough, you can technically ignite your fusion bomb. That is very interesting because in his papers here, he also talks about this idea of having your objects collapse and it increases the pressure, right? Makes sense. If you jam magnets together, the pressure increases. You feel a stronger repulsion as the magnets get closer together. The same idea is we're going to create these pressure waves and we're going to cause this pressure focus directly on the fusion material. That's the idea behind what basically all these equations, all this math is showing. So this is an epsiloidal thermonuclear explosion concept. So it uses an ep uh, epsiloid instead of a sphere to cause your reaction. And notice the reason why the shape is because the shape causes all the waves to focus back towards the center. The idea is you want the waves to all focus back directly towards where you have your material. That's the idea behind it. Wow. This right here reminds me of the video. This reminds me of the MH370 videos. I want to show you guys something as well. Now, take a look at this. You can see there's inward force here, and then there's an outward force as well going on with this. Now, when you watch this MH370 video, as the frames progress between when the zap occurs, we can clearly see a gap. There's a gap between the center implosion and the release on the outside. I mean, you can actually see it implode. Like, you can actually see it implode here. And then we see this release of photons. So something in the middle is going inward. And then the outward side, we're seeing something go out. So we're seeing it get compressed inward, but we're also seeing this expelling of photons, which is either gamma or soft x-rays or something like that. Looks pretty similar. Ablation implosion of thermonuclear target bombarded by beams, either laser or charged particles from many sides. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, that looks very, very similar to what or describes very similar to what the orbs are doing in the MH370 videos. So what did I say before, guys, about maybe they figured out how to make a sphere like around the plane? This textbook explains how, like exactly how. Let me remind you, 
This textbook is from 1981. I was born in 1982. This textbook is older than I am, and it's explaining orb videos from 2014. From 2014. So why am I so sure there's a nuclear connection to the MH370 videos? Because I'm basically looking at the early principles of it from the 80s. Oh, this one's my favorite, though. Look at this. Magnetic Tunneling Wave Accelerator. This is a very similar design to what I imagine the orbs look like on the inside. Concent rings, concentric rings that may be different shapes side by side. The projectile A is a small superconducting solenoid that is accelerated magnetically through external field coils. CR capacitors and S1, S2 are switches to be closed as the projectile moves down the accelerator tube. What? This is like exactly, why is this even in a nuclear textbook? Oh, because this is how you trigger a, 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 a thermonuclear fusion bomb. This is literally an ignition concept for a thermonuclear bomb. <laughs> so wait, you're telling me the thing that I've been saying that the orbs are is listed as an ignition concept for a fusion bomb? To me, there's a lot of stuff here about causing magnetic plasmas to converge onto a single point, like a lot more than I even expected. Did you know that one of the methods for ignition is magnetized plasmas? So he says we can cause thermonuclear ignition to occur with kinetic energy. We can slam some objects together and we can use that as our fusion. That's the that's what that slide basically says right here. We're going to go through some slides I've prepared here. The pressure in the cold thermonuclear explosive is that of a degenerate Fermi gas. In some of these equations, pi and distance r are mentioned. So why is it important that the equations have pi and the distance r in them? Well, because we're trying to create an implosive force by having our orbs come together. That's the distance r. Distance r is collapsing. Pi is important because we're making a sphere. We're making a circle around the plane. We're making an azimuthal ring around the plane. So pi is very important. And everybody loves pi. Apple pie, cherry pie. Whatever kind of pie you want, we got it all. And then the energy levels required. They can calculate the exact energy levels required for ignition. And the reason why I took this slide was it started to make me wonder, what is the energy level required to break the Schwinger limit? Okay, so we need this huge energy density to make this happen. They were talking about pumping energy into a region of space. Pumping it either through light, electricity, chemicals. Chemicals seems like probably the least efficient to me. Laser, optical pumping seems to make a lot of sense. Electrical pumping also seems to make a lot of sense. We also need an energy capacitor. To store an energy of 10 to the 6 joules requires a volume of 10 meters cubed. Substantially smaller volumes can be obtained with water capacitors. But in this case, the charging has to be done very fast or the water suffers dielectric breakdown. The rapid charging in principle could be done by magnetohydrodynamic power conversion of a thermonuclear micro explosion itself. What he's saying is that in order to create a reaction that is going to trigger our fusion bomb, we need a huge amount of energy. We've decided that. Either it needs to be kinetic energy or a laser, whatever. It has to be this huge amount of energy. We can achieve it through magnetohydrodynamic conversion from a micro explosion. He's saying that we can do a compact fusion reaction, an aneutronic reaction that will directly convert into electricity, direct energy conversion. And then we can store that energy on board in a supercapacitor, a supercapacitor that can store more energy than what a normal capacitor can store. We need a supercapacitor. The orbs have supercapacitors on them. 
And I'm fairly convinced, but not 100% sure, they are charging up in this clip. Notice, very noticeable, there's no dark lines behind the orbs at the end. In the beginning, there's clear dark lines behind the orbs. When they're spinning around the plane, getting ready to zap the plane, the dark lines are only in front of the orbs, not behind them. I think they're charging up. I think they're charging up their capacitors. And then once they've charged up, they converge, zap. They're, I think they're acting as a fusion, a fission ignition mechanism. And if you don't believe yet, hang tight. Hang tight. And we found some more sauce chat. Light ion beams. So a light ion beam produces a relativistic electron beam. I have to have a feeling this might be closely related to Charles Chase's coherent matter wave beam. Seems related. When I hear the words relativistic, I start to think about Einstein, time dilation. And then he says, the electron flow from the cathode to the anode is greatly suppressed because the electrons undergo drift motion perpendicular to the electric and magnetic fields. The orbs, the dense plasma focus seems to cause a, a traffic jam. You imagine those electrons are that it's coming through the nozzle of your orb and it's, it's getting compressed down in a highway. Everything's going to kind of slow down as it gets compressed down at that point by the magnetic fields. That seems to be similar to what he's describing in the light ion beams. To focus the beam at the end of the accelerator, a magnetic lens can be used. The focusing ability, although not as good here for lasers, while better than for light ion beams, nevertheless, fully sufficient. So I think this is for the heavy ion beam. So these magnetic focuses, I believe, might be what they're using. Are they using like a magnetic nozzle, either on the front end or on either end of those orbs? That's why we're seeing the dark lines. And you can just shut off one nozzle. Like if you shut off the back of the orb, then when that orb's flowing forward, is it collecting energy? Is it accumulating charge? The idea would be you would release the expellent behind the orb and you'd be sucking in the air, the hydrogen, whatever, from the front. Now, this one, again, was mentioning lithium, whereas tritium was a dirty explosion. And he was talking about micro, micro explosions once again. It says, the prospect for an efficient rocket propulsion system by which large payloads could be moved at great speed within the solar system would also become possible. The micro explosions would take place in the focus of a concave mirror reflector. The magnetic field required for the reflector can be generated by superconducting magnetic field coils. A magnetohydrodynamic loop could therefore pick up a fraction of the explosively released energy. Wow. Is he just saying it? This feels like the precursor to some magic plasma orbs. We've even connected Ning Li. Remember Ning Li, their YBCO superconductors, Eugene Potkinov? Why were those superconductors so important? They were electromagnetic superconductors. Why? Because they can use them in these fusion reactors. They can use them and make tiny fusion reactors using superconducting magnets. Now we understand it wasn't just simple like, oh, spin your superconductor for some anti-gravity. No, it's like we can make magnetic bubbles. We can cause fusion to happen because we have super powerful superconducting magnets now. Thermonuclear lenses and shape charges. Remember that image I was showing you? Here it is. It is possible to obtain perfectly plain, convergent, cylindrical, and spherical detonation waves. As a result, the plasma density must be rather low in the dimensions of the imploded magnetized plasma rather large to satisfy the loss and break-even condition. For this reason, several authors suggested producing the needed implosion velocities by hypervelocity projectile accelerators rather than by magnetic implosion techniques. This would permit much higher plasma densities and hence much smaller plasma dimensions. 
That sounds really similar to the orbs in the MH370 videos. Higher plasma densities, aka dense plasma focus, smaller size plasmas, using them as the ignition method in your fusion reaction. It says it right there, magnetized plasmas. What do you guys think a magnetized plasma is? A magnetized plasma is the MH370 video orbs. When we talk about dense plasma, we're talking about condensing, compressing the plasma down. It's still the same plasma, but now there's more charge in a smaller space. How do you do that? Magnetic fields. Very powerful magnetic fields are what does it. Since we need this huge temperature, the cavity must be imploded into a minimum diameter. Therefore, apart from the initial phase of the implosion process, the magnetized plasma is in a state of complete field reversal most of the time. Are they talking about field reverse configuration right here? Please tell me if I'm misunderstanding the context here. When I read this here, it says the plasmas are in complete field reversal most of the time. And it turns out field reverse configuration is one of the secret sauces that literally helion energy is doing to produce plasmoids. Helion fusion is taking two accelerators of plasma smoke rings, toroids, shooting them together to make plasmoids. The same thing Ken Shoulders was doing. They're doing that and they're doing a field reverse configuration to do that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just connecting dots that don't connect. If so, somebody tell me what this means. Because to me, that's what it means. Is these things are in a field reverse configuration, the magnetized plasmas, which would mean a field reverse configuration would be like spherical, like the Earth, a poloidal field. One of the last few chapters, Winterberg talks about boron. He says... There's theories that say you can use boron, but the temperatures are super high. In fact, I think I want to find that part. Because what he says is that the temperatures are super high, but he says, but it's not within the realm of possibility that we could make a boron reaction occur. And this is the part where I was thinking that um, he might be like letting us in a little bit. Therefore, it cannot be excluded that detonation wave of boron is theoretically possible. Even then, however, if this is only true, if there is no energy less lost by Bremschlong radiation, uh, I think that's X-ray radiation, assuming the correctness of the resulted quote above. Therefore, to make it possible at all, the losses must somehow be reduced. Such a reduction takes place, in fact, at very high plasma densities because of quantum mechanical effects. Um, so yeah, do I need to repeat that for you guys? What he's saying right here is that he's saying, if you do the math, Creating a boron fusion reaction is like barely possible. Like we can barely do it if we have perfect ideal conditions, perfect ideal conditions. And he goes, but actually we can minimize those requirements if we use a high density plasma. Why? Because those dense plasmas have quantum mechanical effects. You tell me he's not talking about plasmoids right now. He's 100% talking about plasmoids. He's talking about dense plasma focus right here. How's the high dense plasma always coming up over and over and over again? The above quoted calculation was made at a rather low plasma density. So what he's saying is that that equation that we did does not take into account high density plasma. So why is boron 11 fusion possible? Why is it even possible when all the NPCs are going, you can't do boron fusion, the energy, it takes too much heat and energy to do it. It's possible through dense plasma. Dense plasma is what makes it possible. 